I'd like to call the public he hearing to order and welcome everyone to the Laverne, Laverne Stormwater Appeals and Advisory Board, August 5th, 2024 at 6 p.m. meeting. We do have a quorum. Our first item of business, adoption of the stormwater management plan. Ms. Alex. Um, so we are required by the state to have a full document that um, goes through all of the different programs that we're planning to implement in order to meet all of our permit requirements. Um, and I guess, should I go through the presentation Next for that now? I think we have a few uh, items before we go to the actual presentation. Well, this is the public hearing part, so okay. just, just to see if anybody has. Okay, yeah. so if anybody has any comments or anything on what that plan is going to look like based on what they've seen, I think that the document is included in your packet, then this is a good time to say that now. Do we have any questions or comments? No, nope, Apparently, so we will entertain a motion to adopt the, the stormwater plan, management plan. I'll make a motion. Well, no, 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 you, yeah, and I guess that probably should have been listed differently, but this would just be a motion to close the public hearing. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So this is a motion I'm to close. Make a motion to adopt that. Motion to close. Close the public yeah. yeah. And Ms. Skinner makes a motion to close. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Motion passes. Meeting adjourned. <laughs> Our apologies. Now it's a That's little. Late. So we're going on. I would like to call the meeting to order and welcome everyone to the Stormwater Appeals and Advisory Board meeting of August 5th, 2024 at 6 p.m. We do have a quorum. Our first item of business is to approve the meeting minutes of August 7th, 2023 meeting. I will entertain a motion. I have that in here. I make a motion to approve the minutes. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Ms. Skinner? Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. Item number two, we do not have anyone present for public comment. And item number three, I will turn over to the city attorney, Mr. Cope. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So item number three on our order of business is election, excuse me, nomination and election of a chairman for a one-year term. And at this point in time, uh, as I chair the meeting, I will open the floor to not nominations for that office. Anybody would like to make a motion to nominate someone? I chair. make a motion to continue the chairman that we have. Okay, that would be Mr. Garvin? Yes, okay, sir, Mr. Garvin, motion. yes. Mr. Skinner, is there a second? Second. Second for Mr. Moss. Any discussion on that item? Okay, hearing none, uh, I will do a uh, roll call, I would think. Okay. Um, secretary. Or, uh, do a roll call. Okay. Yeah. All right, Ms. Skinner? Aye. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman? Aye. Mr. Moss? Aye. Mr. Ho is it Hoagland? Hoagland, yeah. Hoagland? Aye. Okay, aye. Okay, my motion passes. Four ayes. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. turn it back over to you. Thank you, sir. And with that, item number four, motion to nominate and elect the vice chair for a one-year term. I do nominate Ms. Skinner to continue that position. Do we have a second? Aye, second. All in favor say aye. We'd like a roll call. Aye. Ms. Skinner, aye. Aye, myself. Aye. Moss, aye. sir. Eyes have it. Motion passes. On to new business. Item number five. And once again, thank y'all, everyone. Discussion meeting schedule. Ms. Alex. Okay. So we typically, in the past for this board, have always met just once a year. Um, and we've had some changes um, come through with the um, basically our stormwater management ordinance. And the biggest part of that is it's very clearly states the authority of the city engineer that they do not have the authority to issue a variance to our water quality buffer. So with that being stated so clearly in our new ordinance, it's a lot more likely that we <coughs> have some variances that come about that might need to be um, approved or denied. Um, so that's one reason that we, we'd like to try and meet this board twice a year rather than just annually. And the other reason um, is really that the state permit has really tried to push us to be more involved publicly with our stormwater program. Um, so we'd like to give people 
you all included and the public a more opportunity to try and be involved in part of our program. Um, so those are the two big reasons. Um, and I just like to see everybody's faces. <laughs> but yeah, that's my, my reasoning. So are you wanting to put a presentation, would that have to go through mayor and alderman to approve that? No, sir, it wouldn't. So would set a meeting schedule, this board could do that. Okay. So I guess the question would be, would we, with the motion, if, if we decided to go forward with it, because obviously we need to, um, things in the city growth is, and the rule changes are constant. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's probably not a horrible idea. Um, would the motion need to include? What you could do if, Mr. Chairman, if you if you want to accept the recommendation, you, you could ask staff to propose at, uh, uh, dates for subsequent meetings and um, you could, I guess, vote to meet twice a year and then ask staff to sign those dates and to distribute those dates. And even though it's under a discussion item? Um, let's see, where is this? So should we ask staff to put something together? Um, yeah, it is just listed as discussion item. So yeah. Okay. Um, so, so I'm, I'm taking from the board that we do feel that you are correct. Okay. So if you want to put something together so that we can vote on it, okay. I think that'd be appropriate. I think that Skinner. would be appropriate. So, okay. Everyone feel good about that? And then the due process, run it through legal and we'll move forward. Got it. So, and it, it would have to go before the board, uh, the mayor and, mm -hmm. okay. I, maybe. No, it doesn't have to. No. I mean, I think what would probably make sense is to coordinate with Bruce since he's got the master calendar and maybe come up with some dates and then this board will have to meet again to set those dates. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got well, it. Let's be diligent on answering our phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you for the discussion on that item. Item number six, discussion, stormwater management plan and annual report. Excellent. Ms. Alex, here we go. Yeah, back to me. So I'm just, <laughs> okay, so this is a pretty, I would say, comprehensive presentation that is going to talk about our stormwater management plan, which is a required document for the state that goes through each of our different programs. And it's also going to talk about our annual report, so what we did this year. Um, I'll try to be entertaining. <laughs> So just a little bit of an introduction about what our stormwater program, um, like how it started. Um, we are covered under a small municipal separate storm sewer system um, permit from TDEC. So that's for S is MS4. Um, and this basically just allows us to discharge our stormwater into the creeks and streams in Laverne as long as we have developed a comprehensive program to try and reduce pollution of our stormwater as much as possible. And so the program that they want to see or the different programs that they want to see include public education and outreach, public involvement, illicit discharge detection and elimination, construction site runoff, post-construction maintenance, good housekeeping and monitoring of our streams. So we have a different program for each of those things. Um, and so as far as what we're required to report to the state, we have to do an annual report that covers all of the activities within those programs from July 1st um, to June 30th of that year. That's kind of our, our timeline. And we're required to create and share a stormwater management plan to our stormwater appeals and advisory board so that you guys can have some input on what that program looks like and if there's anything we could do better or that needs to be removed, things like that. Um, so this presentation is going to go through each of those management measures and what the permit specifically requires us to do for each of those, um, how we plan to meet those, um, those different requirements through our stormwater management plan, and then how we worked this year, this past year, to kind of meet those different goals. So there will be a lot of things, but hopefully they will be exciting. <laughs> so the first one is our public education and outreach. The permit requirements are basically that we try to um, reach these four different learning objectives um, all over the city in different ways. So they want us to make sure that we're teaching people what, how stormwater can impact water quality, how people can best manage it on their own. Like if you're a homeowner or you're a, um, 
you're a business, how you, what things you can do best to try and take care of your water, um, how you can properly store things and how you can report illicit discharge if you were to see it. Um, so those are the big ones. And we have to teach those things to different groups of people. So the public, we need to meet each of these different um, items at least three times. So that could be 12 events if we don't try and go through it systematically and meet multiple like learning objectives at one event. And that's just for the public. So we also need to do engineering and development community education, um, which means that we're not just going out to our um, like a tabling event where you would go to like community night out or old timers day festival. We also want to actually target the people that are working in the city as well, not just homeowners. Um, we also are required to do employee education, meaning that every employee of the city is supposed to be educated on how to report illicit discharge, how they can best do their job in relation to stormwater. Um, so how do we plan to meet this? Um, in the stormwater management plan, there is a really large chart that looks like this one that has probably close to 20 events listed in it for things that we plan to do in order to meet those different targets. Um, the chart says when we plan to do it, um, what that event is, and a description of what we would be doing specifically at that event. And then it also says which of those learning targets we'll be hitting while we do it. So what things we're gonna be prioritizing at that event. Um, and it also says how we plan on reporting those numbers or the engagement that we made. So whether that's number of people or number of views, if it's a video or things like that. Um, yeah, so that's how we are planning to do that for just our education. Um, some of the different events that we've done this year, just as kind of a summary, we did a high school environmental science teaching where I got to go to the Laverne High School and teach in front of their um, entire freshman class basically about this is what stormwater is, this is why it matters, this is what like careers you can have. So that was fun. We also do our monthly stream cleanups where we try to talk about when we're in the water why you might be seeing higher rates of trash in different places um, and how stormwater works in that regard. We also do an event called Waterfest. We uh, participate in it. It's a they have about 40 vendors that they do and then they have and they're all water themed and it normally reaches about 650 kids um, just at one table. So there's more than that there that you could see, but they rotate through all the events and you get to talk about different stormwater um, things. So they're like TWRA goes there, we go, a bunch of other cities go. It's a really cool event. Um, and we do the regular tabling events where you would go to Old Timers Day, Earth Day, things like that to try and just meet anybody that you can and talk to them about stormwater and why it matters. Um, so our engineering and development community events, um, we had did a presentation where um, we discussed our stormwater management ordinance with a um, the different commercial developers and with um, engineers in the community so that they would know what we're expecting and that they're a little bit more educated on our new ordinances and what we're going to be looking for from them. And that presentation had a really large uh, focus on the effects of biology in the water and how we affect the biology of the water. And it focused on our long-term maintenance agreements where we are um, expecting engineers to design maintenance plans in the long term for their stormwater, not just their things that they're doing right now. And we're planning to continue that maybe in a different format because this was an in-person class and we're thinking of maybe doing that virtually in the future just so that people can have it and then view it and then they don't have to come see our faces. <laughs> um, and the next part is employee education and this is really a work in progress. Um, we've done um, employee education in the past, but we're trying to really revamp that to be more of a um, online learning module situation so that everybody would have to take it and we can say, okay, everybody in the city should know how to report illicit discharge to us if they see it. Um, and we're working with the Cumberland River Compact to do that. They're designing the modules and they're gonna do a lot of the filming and I'll uh, work with them to create something that's really comprehensive that um, hopefully everybody can get a lot out of. Okay, so the next part is public involvement and participation, which is, it overlaps a lot with our public education um, but this is really more about how we can get face time with the people in the city to try and improve our program. That's the main goal of um, public involvement. So we have a different set of learning targets. They're really similar to the other ones that we saw is why they're not included here, but uh, they're slightly different where they want you to physically be in involved with the people 
um, that you're trying to have be part of the program. So there's the public section of that, and then there's also commercial and development again, which is trying to work with contractors um, or um, people that are designing sites to try and make sure that it's a that they also have some type of say in our program. And we also a big part of our public involvement is we're we are required to show and discuss this management plan with our board to allow for input. So that's what we're doing here today. Um, the, we plan to meet these requirements the same way we plan to meet our um, education requirements is we just plan which events we're gonna be part of so that we can make sure we meet all of those different things. Um, for public involvement, the way that we really have done it and plan to do it in the future is one of our biggest things is having the Stormwater Appeals and Advisory Board. Um, we also have our Extreme Squad, which is basically our stream cleanup group that goes out during the warmer months where we go every second Saturday and we do where what I would call the forgotten streams, where we go to these really small streams that don't necessarily have great access, so they might not have a greenway or a really good way to enter them unless you're gonna crawl around and go in and pull trash out. Um, so we do a lot of that. Those are three full truckloads of trash that we pulled out just in the last couple of months. Um, and we do that every summer. So that's a big involvement part for us is to try and just get the community to see what they're protecting. Like this is why it matters. Um, and as far as our commercial and development, the biggest thing that we do, I would say, for um, involvement of this group is our pre-construction meetings where before a, um, group is going to get a permit to build something, we have to sit down and have a meeting where we say, okay, this is um, how we expect this to look. We expect there to not be any um, sediment leaving the site. If we see this, this is when we'll stop work. This is when, they're just setting the standard of what we need to see um, as far as a construction site in the city. Um, and we also had the, the class that I talked about before with education saying that um, we had people come and talk about our ordinance or listen to us talk about our ordinance so that we can um, have them be part of the process as everything changes. Okay, our next section, our third section is um, the permit requirements for illicit discharge and detection and elimination. So basically what the permit requires is that we have a map that shows all stormwater inlets with the direction of flow in their receiving stream. So we have to say, this is an inlet and this is where it goes. And we need a tracking system for any reporting of illicit discharge. So if somebody calls and says, hey Alex, somebody's dumping oil in this inlet, I need to have some way for me to say, hey, this is a spot we really need to watch. And then we also need to track any enforcement that we do on that. So it, everything needs to be written down to say, okay, this is what we did um, as soon as somebody reported to us that this was being dumped here. Um, and we also need to include this illicit discharge reporting in our education efforts. So um, making sure that people know how they can tell, they can call me, email me, they can report it online in our civic, um, I think that's called civic plus, but where you can click on things to put all the complaints in. You can, all, there's an illicit discharge section for that. So how do we plan to meet these requirements? So this is a little bit hard to see right here, but I try to be inclusive of what, um, what all we're trying to show. So this is the direction of flow mapping. So each of those green dots is a stormwater inlet that we went out and individually took pictures and information on each of them to say this is the exact location, this is the direction that the water's flowing. And it also has, um, we put condition conditions into it. So is it, does it need repair? Is it operating the way it's supposed to? Things like that. Um, but it also, helps us to do our illicit discharge mapping because we have, oh, that's kind of hard to see up there, but there are white dots that are all over there, meaning this inlet is fine. This inlet doesn't look like it has any evidence of um, dumping, there's no oil, I don't see anything that looks like a problem, but a red spot means, ooh, this looks like there might be a problem here in the future, so we need to keep an eye on this as an illicit discharge hotspot. So if I don't physically see um, something being dumped there, something that might cause me to mark it as red is if it is a restaurant or a car lot or something where the, um, they might be creating some type of waste and incidentally they might spill it, just something to keep an eye on is what we're using this part of the mapping for. Um, and this is also helping us with tracking. So it helps us to say, okay, if somebody were to report illicit discharge, we can say, oop, this changed to red and we also have an Excel spreadsheet that lists out all of our enforcement things. 
So just a year in review, we had 15 reports of illicit discharge, and that includes city staff and the public calling in, and this doesn't include construction. So this is really just for somebody that saw dumping or something like that. Construction, we get a lot of complaints about that that is something we handle in a different way. Um, but all of these have been resolved or they're in the process of being repaired. And the most common things that we see are sewage malfunctions. So if somebody has a broken septic tank and there's sewage on the ground, that's a form of illicit discharge. Um, a lot of trash dumping, that is a form because it can wash down into our storm drains and oil dumping or car lots. So it might, it, oil dumping is oftentimes not somebody that just was like, mm, I'm just gonna dump this on the ground because I don't know what to do with it. A lot of times it's a malfunction of a storage container like somebody has a storage container that's fallen, op fallen over or it's cracked, and that is also a form of illicit discharge that we're trying to monitor a little bit closer now. Um, and the mapping of high-risk illicit discharge, it allows us to review the remediation plans the right way. So after, so let's, we can use that same example of somebody that may have spilled oil incidentally just from their lot. Um, we need to be able to track where exactly that oil would need to be cleaned up from. So let's say it rained and we have this map, we can track where the oil would have gone through. So we can say, this is what needs to be cleaned up. You need to clean through these pipes because that's where the problems would be. So that's the intent behind the illicit discharge mapping part. Um, our next section is the construction site runoff control. So what we are required to have, the permit requires us to have an inventory of all our active construction sites. Um, it also requires a comprehensive inspection program of construction site erosion control, which we, we do have and have had for a very long time. Um, we have pretty, I would say, high standards for that actually. And we have a comprehensive plans review process. So they wanna see that every single set of plans that's coming through is being looked at to say, hey, are they actually looking at erosion control and is that erosion control solid and working to make it the best that we can? And this is where Gary gets his shout out. Um, Gary does that comprehensive review. He looks at things and makes sure that all of them are just in really good shape before anything gets permitted or pushed um, forward into its next steps. We also on our engineering page, there is a permit viewer where you can access our permit um, software and you can see all of the different permits that are open. So if you click on an address, you can say, oh, they're permitted to do blah, blah, blah. And so that's where you can see a lot of that. And just a year review of our construction site runoff program. We have 51 active construction sites, um, which is, so that doesn't really seem like that high of a number, but it actually is pretty big when you consider one construction site is a subdivision. So that doesn't include individual lots of a subdivision. It's just so one neighborhood would be one active construction site. So there's a lot of construction going on in Laverne right now. Um, and we try to do, we have really good inspectors that try to stay on top of that and do inspections with high standards. Um, we had 652 construction erosion control re-inspections this year, meaning that 652 times an inspector went out, looked at the erosion control and said, that's not good enough, I need you to step it up. So that we try really hard to make sure we're holding everybody accountable to the standards that they're, that they're supposed to be meeting. Um, and all of our, um, Construction proge projects, nothing is permitted until they have that pre-construction meeting that we talked about where we discuss our stormwater um, expectations in depth. So that's a, a big part of the, both of those different sections where you talk about public involvement, but you also talk about construction site runoff to try and bring the two together and make sure you're um, ending up having a solid program. Okay, this is probably um, the fifth section, the post-construction stormwater management is probably the one that's had the most changes um, over the last couple of years. Um, what we're required to have, we are required to have a water quality riparian buffer, meaning in, in the city of Laverne, that's a 60 foot buffer. So from top of bank to 60 feet out, that cannot be disturbed. There's a few um, the rules for variances in there, but for the most part, that's the, that's the standard. Um, we also need to have a complete inventory of stormwater control measures, which is ponds, um, ponds if you had detention or retention, so ponds with water or ponds without water, um, if you had permeable pavement, anything like that, things that need to be maintained over time to make sure that they continue working, that they want a complete inventory of those things. Um, and they want us to have within that inventory um, any enforcement of non-maintained SCM. So if you have a pond that's not taken care of, then that's the, um, we need to be tracking what we've done about that. 
So how do we plan to meet these requirements? The, so first, we have to generate an inventory. We have to look through all the whole city from basically aerials is the easiest way to do it or driving around when you see them. Um, and we have to identify all of the different SEMs in the city and then we have to conduct an inspection on it. So for each pond, we have to go out, conduct an inspection and then send out a notification letter that says, hey, congratulations, you own this pond and you're responsible for taking care of it. Um, and it either will say that it's compliant or non-compliant. So whether or not your pond still needs work. And then the next step is a lot of conversations with responsible parties. So the people that own the pond and also the people that they've hired to take care of the ponds. So chatting with them about this is what we expect, this is what we wanna see going forward. So that first inspection that we did that I just talked about was really like a courtesy inspection. That was a, hey, just wanna make sure we're all on the same page. Everybody here that it, we're reaching out to owns a pond, you're all responsible for it. And then we're planning to do re-inspections this October that say, okay, now we're getting into citation zones if you're really not taking care of it after we've given you like a 10 month warning, basically. And then if they still are not taking care of it, we'll move into enforcement action. So where are we at for this year's review? Like how far have we gotten? We've completed all the inspections, we've sent out the notification letters and currently we're having a lot of conversations with responsible parties to try and get people moving in the right direction. So the next step is those reinspections and then moving towards enforcement which will be. Now, is very this helpful. also like considered uh, like uh, ponds or detention, retention mm -hmm. ponds and stuff like this? Yes, ma'am. Uh, and they're supposed to clean it up and keep mm -hmm. it clean. And, mm -hmm. But yep. if you try to find out who has it in certain subdivisions, Nobody knows. Yeah, that is that has definitely been a challenge is finding the person that is responsible for some of the ponds. And if there isn't a person is figuring out how to get it handled and who you. Um, right. Yeah, that's definitely been a struggle with this. But that's the one of the things that we're working towards also. There's and is the next to me, there's trash and mm -hmm. kids chairs and stuff like that in there. Yep. They're, they actually, they did get an inspection saying, yeah, you gotta get yeah. the trash out of that. <laughs> but so they'll get a reinspection in October and hopefully it's been cleaned up. And if it hasn't, then we'll, we move forward. Um, yeah, so that's the post construction. The next one is good housekeeping. So good housekeeping basically means they wanna make sure the city is doing the right thing as well. So our buildings, our ponds, everything we do needs to also be upkept to good standards. So it's doing employee training so that people know exactly what things they're expected to do and then creating an operation and maintenance program for your um, buildings. And you're required to report to them which buildings have it, how, what your inspection sheet looks like and things of that nature. So how we're planning to accomplish this, we currently have operation and maintenance inspections quarterly for our public works facility, our parks and recreation and for city hall. Um, the eventual growth of this inspection or this inspection program will hopefully include fire halls um, in the near future, but it doesn't currently. And then we're, again, that employee education is still being created, but that will be for all employees to make sure that everybody knows what they're expected to do. And it'll be kind of be split into field and non-field so that people can know in their, their specific area what's the best thing that they can be looking for or doing. Um, in our year review, we actually started doing the parks and recreation and the city hall operation and maintenance plans this year. Um, it's, it, we're trying to grow that program a lot to make sure we're keeping ourselves accountable as well. And we did complete our quarterly reviews and any outstanding issues that we had have been either repaired or they're on the docket to be repaired um, in the near future. Okay, and this is the last one <laughs> is our, the permit requires us to do stream monitoring and there's three different types that they require us to do. Um, they require E. coli testing to make sure that there's no pathogens in the water or there's not, there's an acceptable level of pathogens. Um, we do visual stream assessment, assessments, excuse me, um, which is if you have a stream that's listed as impaired, it means that you walk that entire section of stream to see what things can be improved. So if you have really bad erosion, if you have an outfall that looks like it might have pollution coming from it, if you have what they call like a fish barrier, like if things have lifted too high and the fish can't move through it, that can be um, a sign of issues. So just they, it helps to um, build a good plan for what you wanna do to improve that section of stream. 
And we also um, are required to do benthic macroinvertebrate sampling, which basically, a side note, what are benthic macroinvertebrates? This is my biology side note. I know a lot of you have seen this picture a lot of times, but I'm gonna do it again. <laughs> so in an ideal perfect world, when we're doing this testing, we would have every single one of these organisms. We would have a really diverse group. We'd even, even, it seems weird, but you would even have a couple of leeches or you would have a lot of crayfish or something. You just would have an even spread of everything. But as soon as we have water that gets a little bit polluted, we start to lose this section of pollution sensitive organisms. So you lose your river mussels, you use water, or you lose the water pennies, and then you get a little bit more pollution and you start to lose your crayfish and your dragonfly larva. You don't see any of that anymore. So the only things that you're really seeing are things like scuds or aquatic worms, which feel like really, I would say, gross organisms, but they're not. They just have different adaptations to live in <laughs> gross water, so we get a lot of them. Um, so the dream when you do this benthic macroinvertebrate testing is you take a net in the water and you go scoop, 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 and you get a really wide variety of organisms. So that's what we're really hoping for we actually, this is a neat thing. We, for our testing that we did five years ago, they found a water penny, which is under the pollution sensitive, um, which I think really pushed us over the edge in getting that stream delisted as impaired. Because that stream's no, we don't have to do as much monitoring on that stream anymore because they were like, well, the water must be decent because we're getting some of these pollution sensitive organisms. Um, so some of our past monitoring, or monitoring we um, did our E. coli testing, and really when you do E. coli testing, you're only required to do one section, like one spot on a section that would be listed by the state as having high pathogens. But we went kind of above and beyond before just so we could try and pinpoint where some of the problems were. And these, it's a little bit hard to see it, but some of these red sections were one of the ones that were high for E. coli. Um, so when we do our monitoring coming up soon, that'll be this year, we're planning on testing some of these more um, like choke point areas where so we can say, okay, have things improved or not because we're um, gonna just be, we'll be doing a few less of them just to see if we can get a bigger, like a bigger picture um, read of what's happening. Um, and then the, that goes along with our plan for future monitoring. So like I was saying, we're gonna do a few less points um, for our E. coli sampling, just to kind of get a big picture of what's, what's going on. Um, and then our visual stream assessments where we walk the stream, we'll do a little bit less of that because East Hurricane Creek was delisted, so we don't have to walk that one now. Um, but that'll hopefully give us a little bit more time to focus on some of the other ones. Um, like Hurricane Creek is one that we'll walk as well as Finch Branch. Um, and then we will be conducting benthic macroinvertebrate sampling just to, and we'll get to see what kind of organisms we have in each of the waterways. And you're only required to do this monitoring for the streams that are listed as impaired because they want you to be improving them in different situations. Um, yes, so the things that we plan to improve overall, um, we're building that comprehensive employee education program and that's to be rolled out soon. I know I've said that a lot of times, that's a big thing that we have to do to get in compliance. Um, we're working towards a more um, involved stormwater advisory board so that we can try and have you guys be part of our outreach and just part of the program in general to help us make it the best we can make it. Um, and we're gonna continue forward with that illicit discharge mapping, making sure that's up to date and that we have everything in there as um, accurately as possible and those permanent stormwater inspections where we said moving into those next October round of those, that's coming soon. And then increasing the number of city buildings that have those quarterly inspections to make sure we're doing everything that we need to do. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> I know that was a lot of information <laughs> to throw, but. No, I think you covered everything. Uh, okay. covered. I even had pictures. Does everyone feel the same way? Cool. I do, yes. Thank you, ma'am. That was very informative. Thank you. Um, with that being a discussion, no questions or comments, board? We will move on to item number seven. Thank you. Item number seven, recommendation to the Board of Mayor and Alderman, adopt the stormwater management plan. Ms. Alex. So that's basically all of those, um, everything that we just discussed, there is a document that lists out all of those programs in detail with dates and descriptions and all of that. So this is just the adoption of that as our official plan um, and saying it's been, we was open for 
um, comment so people could have a say in it and then moving forward with it from there. Very good. Do we have any questions or comments in regards to that? I think she covered everything. <laughs> yeah, pretty much everything. Well, we will be making a favorable or non-favorable recommendation in the motion, so we will entertain a motion. I make a motion. We accept it. We send a favorable recommendation. Favor favorable. We have a motion for a favorable recommendation. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, the motion passes. We'll be sending that with a favorable recommendation. Thank, Thank you, you. ma'am. <laughs> On to item number eight. Recommendation to the Board of Mayor and Alderman, additional sinkhole protection requirements in the storm water management ordinance. Mr. Sure. Lott? <laughs> there you go. Thank yes, you, sir. there you go. Okay. All right, as you all know, uh, last year we passed the, the storm water management ordinance where we took out uh, chapter six of and chapters three and six and replaced them with the new chapter six with a lot more detail, with a lot more focus on what the engineers had to do. Uh, meanwhile, while we were doing that, the US Supreme Court was busy with uh, Sackett versus the EPA and they were much more narrowly defining the uh, scope of what the Clean Water Act could protect. Alex, was spitting nails the day that <laughs> she came in madder than a hornet and she was just fussing all day long and for many days thereafter. <laughs> you can't write out what But what this did was it took out waters and, and points where non point source pollution got into the, the water system that weren't absolutely directly tied to navigable waterways, which took out most of our sinkholes. Mm -hmm. We live in Laverne. This is sinkhole country. So in essence, the, the EPA, US EPA, is, is out of the sinkhole business for 99% for of sinkholes in the country, and they put it down to the state. Well, the state, uh, they do have a sinkhole permitting process, but it is also kind of narrow in scope in that it is for commercial and industrial or entire uh, residential subdivisions. Uh, single families don't have to get it, but most importantly to us, you don't have to get a state permit to dump stuff into a sinkhole if it's on your property. And that has been an issue in the city of Laverne. And so we've had a couple of cases recently of where, where we've looked, Alex and I have had long talks, done tons of research, got on the internet, talked to people, and really found nothing to tell these homeowners that are impacted except, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to sue your neighbor. We don't have any kind of ordinances for this. So we'll go real quick. I'm an engineer, so I gotta go back to ground zero and talk about what is a sinkhole. <laughs> Come to uh, my house and I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> Come to anybody's house in Laverne and show you. But uh, this one is right off of uh, Stones River Road right. uh, between Murfreesboro Road and the railroad tracks. Yep. And you can see it is underneath Stones River Road. Mm. That sucker continues to grow. We're treating that one as a city project right now. But uh, that's the kind of thing we have where it could impact public facilities. And the way a sinkhole is formed, let's see if I can, no, oh, here I am, good. Um, I broke the laser, by the way, so we'll have to get a new laser for the next time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, around here, we're on top of dolomite limestone. It's about four foot deep, uh -huh. and the top layer of that limestone, it's like a fracture zone. It looks like you took a hammer on a bunch of sheets of glass and tapped it so there's b broken things, and the water travels through those cracks. And as it travels through the cracks, um, it both wears into the limestone, but it also begins to erode an area out in the dirt over the top, and that gets bigger, and then one day, foomph, it falls in, and you have a sinkhole. It is sudden. This happens out of nowhere. I mean, luckily, up in Clarksville, down in Florida, where the rock is 25, 30, 40 foot down, those sinkholes eat your house. At least we don't have that here. But uh, so, and then you have a throat in the sinkhole, and the water flows into there, into the underground and then through the uh, underground system. But the key thing to remember is that sinkholes are caused by flowing water, okay, not standing water. So the flowing of the water is what's really important. So I, I know this is kind of a, this one doesn't show up so well either, um, but to say that there's areas of Laverne that are more sinkhole prone, the whole city has sinkholes all in it, but this area down here 
near Lake Forest on the edge of Morningside type of area. That is just wall to wall sinkholes, this area in here between old Nashville, Jefferson, and, and uh, Murfreesboro Road. All of the drainage in that area goes to sinkholes and pops out in Finch Branch. And this uh, Woodland Hills area is just full of sinkholes. And we'll look at a picture of one of those a little bit later. So your concern is why is this? I, I told you earlier, sometimes we just tell you've got to sue your neighbor. It's a civic issue. Uh, so why is filling or use a sinkhole a public concern? Why should the city change our ordinance for that? And I'm going to give you four examples, two of which have happened in the last couple of years, and two happen everywhere all the time. So here's our sinkhole we just had. So the uh, sinkhole is dropped out. This is the throat where the water drains down and gets into the underground cav cavity. And so you can't see it at all, but there are property lines up here. And in this particular <laughs> issue, there's a property line right down in the middle of this sinkhole. Uh, this is something we're involved in right now. It's over near Jefferson Pike. And one of the uh, neighbors has looked at that and said, I want a nicer side yard. So they filled it in. And so you can see, we're, we're, again, we're working with them through the land disturbance permit. But when you do that, the next time it rains, you've got water. And now you can see there's, the, there's that property line I was telling you about. And his neighbor is getting the flood water from him getting his uh, side patio or whatever he wants to do. So that is one place where messing with the sinkhole or pulling a sinkhole crosses property lines and gets multiple neighbors involved. Uh, here's example number two. Uh, this is an example that happened in an industrial area out Jefferson Pike near Smyrna. This is completely owned by one landowner. It was back behind his buildings. Uh, he decided to go back there. We could not stop him because he owned the sinkhole, and he did this. So as you can imagine, it rains, this happens. And it goes over property lines on both sides, particularly to the east towards Smyrna. It, has to, it gets up and drains through a neighbor's property and on out to the street. And so again, multiple landowners are affected by one landowner filling their sinkhole. Now, example number three, uh, sinkholes, again, they, they, they're, bleh, they uh, work through underground channels. And if the water builds up, they can get pressurized. And they are tied, particularly to Finch Branch, in a big way. And so you've got this sinkhole here. And what do we do when we have sinkholes in the city of Tennessee? We put our garbage in it. <laughs> OK, so a lot of people do. and then it rains. And this gets pressurized, it pumps, and it gets this garbage into our stream. And Alex was just talking about how East Hurricane Crate being delisted saves the city money every five years. If it gets listed again, it starts costing us money every five years. So these are the things that, that increase the pollution in our streams and <coughs> increase our levels of state mandated testing. And the last one is and this, I'll show you a picture of this, but the water flows on through and it's heading on down to Percy Priest Lake or wherever it's going. And it's working just fine. Water flows through the croak, it goes down. But then somebody fills it in, that filling comes in, and it blocks. So the water builds up, it gets pressurized, and it's got to find a new route. And it can do this, it goes back up into the fracture zone. And when you have water moving up here again, you get a new sinkhole, <laughs> except this one's in a random location. You don't know where it's going to happen. And they tend to happen like this. This is Woodland Hills. Um, and see this big patch area? Woodland Hills, like I said, I'm going to back up a second. Uh, it was an area chock full of sinkholes. And as they built the subdivision, they filled a whole bunch of them in. So the, the, the road dropped out. This is Woodland Hills Road. And it dropped out right here. This is a big patch where the city had to go in and repair it. So what they do, they repaired that one. The water was able to get past that point. It went four more feet. It found another blockage. And we have a new sinkhole. And that's what this down here says. That's in yellow. That writing says sinkhole. So we have a new sinkhole forming that right now they're, they're patching. But it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And we're going to ultimately have to do this. And once we repair that one, it may move 10 more feet down and start a new sinkhole. So once we start these processes and sinkholes, once it gets under a road, it kind of unravels like a sweater. 
and uh, it can cost the city a great deal of money. So you've got it better in, I've handed it out to you. Uh, so could, what you see in red on there is what we're adding or recommending to be added to the stormwater management ordinance. It's added in the engineering requirements. So what we've got here, uh, we copied it uh, hook, line, and sinker from the Montgomery County version of this. So, so we got one that at least was vetted by another county and is already in somebody else's ordinance. And it is really a focus on what engineers have to provide us before we can approve a land disturbance permit that includes filling or utilizing a sinkhole. So a lot of it is just detailed thing about you have to prove that the 100-year storm doesn't flood your neighbors. You have to prove this. And then it gets down to the last part where you've got to include the sinkhole uh, in your long-term maintenance agreement and long-term maintenance plan, which are parts of the existing ordinance. And that allows us to make sure that their long-term maintenance plan says we won't put garbage in there. Okay, so, the, so to protect the, uh, the stream and the underground system. So it really is just adding this section here, section Roman numeral 15, again, it's in red in your uh, handout, and that is what we are recommending that y'all recommend to the Board of Mayor and Aldermen for inclusion into the stormwater management ordinance. Any questions? Hit another button and it says any questions. There you go. There you go. Any questions? Mm -hmm. No. Um, I'll touch on it slightly. So the, the, we will be adding requirements like we do when we're doing a subdivision. They'll have to come to you, injection well, permitting, exactly. testing. Well, not an injection well. The injection well is a state, if, if, that, if the actual injection well permit. We are really, they have to submit to us if they're going to mess with the sinkhole, and it doesn't require a state permit. We're not going to be redundant with the state. Yes. If it does not require a state permit, then we will work with them on how best to fill it. You can fill a sinkhole. Just you doing do it, it appropriately. Correctly. And that will give you some power to right. help our citizens get our it done appropriately. It will drawing review process. Okay. And will it go down to the smaller lots, individuals as well? Any if, sinkhole? If they're filling a sinkhole, yes. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? And we will be sending a favorable or unfavorable recommendation favorable. to the Board of Mayor and Aldermen. Yes. Would you like to make a motion for a favorable recommendation, Ms. Skinner? No, not all, not right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fighting with one next door, so. So we, we will entertain a motion for either a favorable or unfavorable recommendation to move this to the Board of Mayor and Aldermen. I will make a favorable recommendation or a motion for a favorable recommendation. Ms. Skinner, you second it. All in favor say aye. 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 Yeah, aye. People will really dump their trash in their sinkholes. A little discussion. Yeah. People dump a lot of trash in their sinkholes. That's a long standing it, Tennessee it, tradition. It yeah. also, even if people aren't dumping it in there, it, um, yes. typically is, we'll have like sinkhole based drainage. So if people have trash in their yard, it will, eventually make its way into there. So littering becomes a Welcome to Tennessee. <laughs> Depends on where you live in Laverne as well, too. If you live in the, the back side of Lake Forest where there's not as many houses around yeah. and you have a little property back there. I'm yeah. up Jones Mill. Yeah, you'll yeah. you'll you'll fill it with, with trash. And, and <laughs> white goods for some reason find their way into sinkholes. Refrigerators and yeah. stuff. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Our materials from building a house. Mm -hmm. There was a couch that someone had to add to Google. <laughs> so with that, we have a motion for a favorable recommendation with a first and second. All in favor have said aye, all four of us. All opposed? Motion passes. We will be sending a favorable recommendation to the Board of Mayor and Aldermen. And our final item, item number nine, discussion stream bank stabilization project next to the library. Yeah. Okay. This one's a quick one, and does, <laughs> you don't have to vote on anything. Promises, <laughs> promises. <laughs> promises. <laughs> uh, part of the stormwater program is we have a stormwater construction team that y'all see around improving things, fixing catch basins, and uh, they, uh, to, to brag on them, they're, they're a great group, hardworking. A year and a half ago, there were 62 backlogged work orders going back four years. 
uh, for the last six to eight months. We have between 10 and 20, and that's how many are coming in, and none of them are over a year old. Those guys have, have, have worked their tails off and done a great job, and they do very, very high quality work. When I came to the city, I was really impressed with the just actual construction quality. So one thing that we've got over by the uh, library next to the Greenway, uh, we've got, uh, there's a, a stretch, you can see that little picture there, where it's meandering. And in the meanders, the heavy storms, comes, winds left, right, and then back left again. There's the big uh, picnic pavilion. There's the parking lots and the streams here. Library is over here. Like I, there's the picnic pavilion. That's a multi-use facility, pardon me. And the library is over here. And where it makes this left turn, it's beginning to erode. And it's eroding towards the greenway, and the greenway is in jeopardy. So this is just showing you engineering drawings, just to show you we're doing them, because we have to submit it to the state. That's really boring stuff. We won't get into details. More of the stuff we're going to get submitted to the state. We've got to show them cross-sections and exactly where the cross-sections are. All right. Here's the more interesting part. So here's where we have the eroding bank on the outside. There's a picture of it. You can see these are all tree roots and stuff that have been unearthed through the erosion. So the first step we're going to do, and this is Alex's design concept, is we're actually going to cut back a little bit, put large flat stones, which we already have, they're not going to cost the city anything, into the bottom of the, of the creek as a foundation for it. And there's a picture that shows some uh, similar, we haven't started this yet, but there's some similar flat stones where someone else did it. Then on top of that, we're going to lay geotextile, a fabric down, put dirt on it, fold it over like a pillow, then put more and work our way up. The, uh, the bank so that we have a sloped back natural looking bank. And you can see a picture where somebody's done that precise thing. So we're, we're not trying to reinvent a wheel here, going with things that have been proven successful in the past. And then Alex's favorite part, we're gonna add willow sprigs and native vegetation that are gonna grow in, put the uh, stream cover, the canopy back over the, the stream. Uh, so that we can control the temperature of the water and not have any problems with biological oxygen demand. And there's a couple of pictures. There's people plugging in those willow sprigs and, and what one looks like right after. But it'll eventually grow back in to a nice canopied section right there next to the uh, picnic pavilion and be a, a nice place uh, for people to hang out and protect the uh, greenway. And that's it. Very good. We're excited about it because when you have um, erosion like that, you get a lot of sediment in the water during those heavy rains. So if we can lay it back and make sure it's stable for a very long time after this, we'll get a lot better water quality in that section. Actually, if you so. look at this picture right here, it's, pretty it's brown. Yeah, so and that was probably 24 hours after a big rain. So it still is a little bit, you just see like long effects from it when you have it be that eroded on the sides. So we're gonna, we're gonna fix it. Which we appreciate really that. <laughs> but it, it was still flooding back there at times. But um, I think sometimes the water gets high. I don't know how often it leaves the banks over there, but this will mainly be something for quality um, rather than for quantity. But it, um, it should be something that'll be nice. Right. Yeah, we're, like we're, we're not going to constrict the flow any by doing this. So right. we're not going to make anything worse. Yeah. But it is, is, as Alex said, it's a quality issue that we're working on here. Very good. And Do that any... is the end of the agenda as written. Do we have any questions or comments from the board? No. no we look, like we... Good. <laughs> Very nice. Well, thank you all. Excellent presentation. Yes. And thank you, everyone. Meeting adjourned.